Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 39 years we have engaged the community in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Our hour-long forums are free and open to all, and we invite you to join us in the sanctuary of Westminster Church for upcoming events. Information can be found at westminsterforum.org or on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis. And I'm the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Jim Shudo is CNN's chief national security correspondent and co-anchor of the weekday news program, CNN Newsroom. He reports and provides analysis on all aspects of U.S. national security, including foreign policy, the military, the intelligence community, and the ongoing Russia investigation. Prior to joining CNN, he served as ABC News senior foreign correspondent, reporting from more than 50 countries, including Russia, China, Myanmar, Zimbabwe, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Syria. From 2012 to 2013, he served as Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to China, Gary Locke. An award-winning journalist, he received the Headliner Award for the documentary Targeting Terror Inside the Intelligence War, a citation for excellence from the Overseas Press Club, the George Polk Award for his undercover reporting inside Myanmar, and the Edward R. Murrow Award for his reporting from Iran. A graduate of Yale University with a degree in Chinese history, he's the author of the new book, which is the topic of today's presentation, The Shadow War, Inside Russia's and China's Secret Operations to Defeat America. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Jim Shudo. I don't normally get whistles, but I'll take them. I want to begin by saying that my Catholic mother always dreamed of me speaking from a pulpit. <laughs> Though I think she imagined me with a collar. As they say, a, a, a priest for a son is every Irish mother's dream, every Italian mother's nightmare, but anyway, that's the other half of the family. It, it, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thank uh, the minister. Uh, I want to thank all of you for taking out a t time out of your day. I want to thank the state of Minnesota for arranging what this East Coaster can only imagine is an unusually balmy <laughs> late fall day where I didn't have to wear ear flaps to survive. But uh, I've always loved Minneapolis, and when I flew in last night, it was just a beautiful view of the city. Uh, you're lucky people to live out here. Uh, I want to start by taking this conversation out of the hypothetical because what I talk about in this book and what I report on virtually every day on CNN is happening as we speak. The shadow war, as I call it in the book, more on that later, but uh, on probably the front of that war that you and most of us are most aware of, uh, election interference, it's happening right now as we speak. Not a theoretical threat, not a threat off in the distance, not one that we can hope may or may not happen with regards to the 2020 election. It's happening today. I would say to people that, that I see fronts in the shadow war virtually every day in my job, and that's true. And I'm just going to give you a few from the last 24 hours to put a point on that. Yesterday, you might have seen that Facebook disabled hundreds of fake Facebook accounts uh, sourced from both Russia and Iran, in this case, that were doing what we saw in 2016, which is distribute fake news, real fake news, not the one that I'm accused of <laughs> propagating. Real fake news with intent, right? Intent to damage uh, particular political candidates or parties uh, to political advantage, exactly as we saw in 2016. So Facebook doing some work that it did not do uh, in 2016 to disable hundreds of accounts. Be, be, be comfortable knowing that today, there'll be hundreds more accounts just like that, trying to avoid those same uh, things because the, the attackers get smart. As we get smart, they get smarter. China, you might have noticed in the most recent sort of trade deal or trade truce 
uh, is now buying agricultural products from key swing political states. That is, uh, and I know that Minnesota has its farmers too, that is election interference of a different kind. China knows where uh, the states, what the states are that are going to play a role in this next election. Not buying and buying at particular times, in addition to applying pressure to this administration, is election interference by another means. It's happening right now. You might have seen a story yesterday in the Washington Post about President Trump's view of Ukraine having been influenced by, surprise, Russian President Vladimir Putin, but also Viktor Orban of Hungary, the other great new authoritarian in Europe of the day. So both of them speak to him, sour him on Ukraine, get the U.S. president to change its view of Ukraine, which has been under its current leadership and the prior leadership a pretty good friend in Europe and should have the things and does have the things that you would imagine uh, a country like the U.S. would support. It wants democracy, it wants to fight corruption, it wants a closer association with Europe, not entrance into the EU, etc. And by the way, it's currently at war with Russia and is occupied by hundreds, thousands of Russian forces. Uh, what Putin and Orban did to our president is an influence operation. You might have heard that term used in intelligence circles. An influence operation is using power uh, to influence either a population or politicians to become closer to your view. It's a pretty successful one on the part of Russia and its ally, Orban. Again, this is stuff that's just happening in the last 24 hours as an example of how election interference is happening as we speak. By the way, I think there's a better term for it than election interference. I think it should be called election disruption. And meddling is a term we should just forget about, because meddling is something you do in your you know, neighbor's private lives. It's not what you do when you're trying to change an election. Uh, the final one, I think, is the most uh, sobering. And that is the portion of the current Ukraine scandal that's the subject of the impeachment inquiry that, to me, is the most alarming one. And that is this idea of the DNC server being somehow in Ukraine. Okay? That is BS. Okay? It's not true. There's no facts to support that. The U.S. intelligence community documented through a thousand different means that it was Russia that interfered in the 2016 election. Uh, I write about, in a chapter in the book, uh, one of the ways they did that was because in 2014 and 2015, the same Russian actors who interfered in the 2016 election, these two hacking groups that you might have heard about, Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear, which are actually units of Russian military intelligence, those same hackers, they're hackers, had infiltrated the State Department email system in 2014 and 2015 with great success. Uh, so it was easy for the NSA to spot 2016 interference because it was coming from the same direction. And hackers, by the way, uh, like all of us, they've got signatures. They leave fingerprints. They like, they're they're kind of lazy. They like to do things the same way. So, without getting into too much detail, the NSA could see that lines of code that they had used to hack into the State Department servers in 2014-15 were the same lines of code they'd used to hack in 2016. Because if you're a hacker, if it works that time, you're like, hey, let me just cut and paste that over there, zap it in there and see if it works again. There's no doubt in the U.S. intelligence community, in bipartisan committees on the Hill, who interfered in the 2016 election, not just which country, but which actual guys going by Moscow hours, by the way, because they could also tell when they logged onto their computer and when they logged off their computer, another telltale sign, uh, who infiltrated. It was not Ukraine. But we have a sitting president and some of his allies now saying, we really got to look into this Ukraine server. Theory. It's not a theory. It's a conspiracy theory. There's no basis. That was alarming to me, because here we are, a year and a month away from the next election, and the sitting president will not acknowledge who interfered in the last one, which raises hard questions about whether he's going to credibly defend the next election. So what's happening is you have election interference, disruption, happening today from both the outside with success, but also from the inside. And that's the part that's most sobering to me as an American, uh, not a political statement. I voted Republican and Democrat in my life. My family's full of Republicans and Democrats, as I imagine you are. I just look at it as an American. Political Pearl Harbor happened in 2016. 
are we going to defend against it as a country in 2020? That to me is an open question. So that's today. I want to expand a bit to talk to you about what the shadow war is because it has more than one front. And that's what's particularly alarming about this, that, that Russia, but also China, two different countries, two different intentions, two different capabilities, are attacking the US and the West with very similar tactics on four fronts. So starting on influence operations, like we saw with election interference in 2016 that's happening today. I'm going to start with that front. I just want to tell a story about how it played out in 2016 that I'm sure some of you are aware of, but the details here uh, are very telling. You had the hacking of the DNC servers and the release of that material around the time of the Democratic Convention in 2016. The pattern here is steal the materials with intent and then weaponize it and time it for maximum effect. Steal stuff from the DNC, release it during the Democratic National Convention to sow discord within the Democratic Party. The story of John Podesta's emails, Hillary Clinton's, of course, campaign chairman at the time, even more telling. So first of all, let's, figure, let's tell the story of how this happened. How many of you have gotten a Gmail password reset email in your life? Raise your hand. Or whatever we're talking about, Schwab, you know, it, it, we, get, we get them every day. So John Podesta gets it, sends it to his assistant, who rightfully sends it to their IT person and says, hey, is this legitimate? Should we do it? The IT person in one of the most Shakespearean autocorrects of our time emails back uh, with the intention of saying it's illegitimate and it's autocorrected to legitimate. So John Podesta's poor assistant clicks on the link and Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear have access to tens of thousands of Podesta emails. Small things, and I'll get to that later because all of us have a role in defending against this kind of stuff in the future. It's, it's blunt force tactics. It's not that clever at the end of the day, but it works. When, let's go to timing. When are John Podesta's emails released? Does anybody remember that date in uh, early October? I remember because my daughter was christened the next day. We had a lot of family in town, and this was all breaking as we were having cocktails, and it was the subject of conversation, you might imagine. <laughs> In fact, I remember we had someone who was working with the Clinton campaign there at the, uh, it was a friend of my wife's, uh, who was at it and, and was in deep phone conversations with her colleagues about when Donald Trump was going to run out of the race. Point was, that was the day that the Access Hollywood tape was released. How long after the Access Hollywood tape was released were John Podesta's first emails first exposed on the internet by WikiLeaks? Anybody have a guess? Loud. High school folks, someone give me a guess. Someone said 10 minutes? I heard 10 minutes. It was 22 minutes. Think that was an accident? Steal, weaponized, time for maximum effect. That's an influence operation. And it worked. You know, if you look at the news media's role during that crisis, we took all this information hook, line, and sinker, reported it every day. That's something that's still should be the subject of conversation going forward. How do you handle this stuff? How do you handle stolen information that is being weaponized, particularly if it is newsworthy? Because some of that was newsworthy. You know, the disagreements within the Democratic Party over Sanders and Clinton, newsworthy. What do you do when it's part of a strategy? It's a question. I'd love to hear your, que your, your thoughts on that when we get to questions. So that's, that's front one of the shadow war. Let's go to front two, and this one is uh, always the one I think that sparks the most wide-eyed reaction. Raise your hand if you think there are lasers in space today. All right. We and other kinds of weapons. It's a leading question, you know, I wrote the book. <laughs> Probably guess where I'm going with this. Uh, there are weapons in space today, de deployed, by what, deployed and tested successfully by both Russia and China. Uh, and you have three categories. We have what U.S. Space Command, and for the book, I spent weeks at a number of Space Command bases around the country. Uh, they call them directed energy weapons, but they're laser weapons. They're already deployed. They can range in capability from dazzling a satellite, blind it, kind of the satellite equivalent of slant, you know, shining a laser in a pilot's eye, up to fry equipment if the burst is powerful enough. Those are already floating around in space, and some of them are powerful enough to do it from the surface of the Earth up to crucial satellites. 
There are also kidnapper satellites in space deployed by China. And I will tell you a story about how U.S. Space Command discovered them. US, the U.S. Space Command uh, monitors every launch of a missile on the surface of the Earth. Anytime a burn comes from the base of a missile, our sensors light up from satellite, from on the ground, because someone's launching a nuclear missile at us, we want to know what's happening. But this means we can catch a lot of stuff. Uh, so we monitor every space launch as well and see what they put up in space. So China, a few years ago, sent up a rocket with two satellites, and we saw them come out of the final stage and start orbiting the Earth. And then a couple weeks later, one of those disappeared. And the guys in space, mechan I should say the men and women in space command, I've been there, it's very mixed. Uh, what happened to that other satellite? Did it disintegrate? Did it, did it fall out of orbit, decaying orbit, break up in the atmosphere? And then, a week later, it appeared again, and then it disappeared again. Eventually, they figure out that what's happening is that the Chinese satellite had a grappling arm, and it was plucking that little satellite out of orbit and then releasing it again. Now, China calls that a maintenance satellite, or even a garbage collection satellite, pick up debris in space, which is a real problem. U.S. Space Command doesn't believe that. We believe it's a credible weapon that could pluck crucial U.S. or other adversaries' satellites out of orbit in the event of a war or a smaller skirmish where they could disable key U.S. satellite capabilities. Why do China and Russia want to do this? The U.S. has an enormous technological advantage in space. Uh, we also have an enormous dependency on it. You and I do, and I'll get to that in a moment, but particularly our military. Smart bombs are smart because of GPS technology. The drones fly, again, because of GPS technology. Navigation, monitoring of chemical weapons use, monitoring of, like I said before, the launch of any missile. Is it a nuclear weapon headed our way? Uh, but also right down to troops in the field. I've been embedded with US forces. You'll see a squad commander pull out a hardened laptop and take advantage of what's known as the red dot system. This is a system for all deployed U.S. forces that, that pulls in all the intelligence we have, including from satellites, to identify bad guys. So my squad commander can look on there and say there's a red dot on the other side of that berm. Uh, guys, don't go that direction, or let's drop a mortar round down there. Again, dependent on satellite technology. No one else has that capability. But because they don't, they want to take it away from us in the event of a war or something short of a war. And both China and Russia have therefore deployed weapons in space to take that away. Russia also has, by the way, what are called kamikaze satellites. I get into that in more detail in there. Those are more blunt force kind of weapons, just ram and destroy satellites in space. Performs the same trick. Bottom line is asymmetric warfare with tremendous technology in space. That's the space front. I want to go underwater now. Submarines. The new great game in military technology today is under the waves. Both China and Russia have been deploying more capable, and this is key, quieter, harder to detect submarines around the world. A quieter, harder to detect submarine is a first strike weapon because it could pop up off your coastline. And by the way, these submarines carry nuclear weapons, sadly, most of them do. And in the event of a war, or again, something smaller, can launch an unannounced nuclear attack on, on U.S. interests or even the U.S. homeland. To, to show that off, both Chinese and Russian subs, which are getting better, will occasionally pop up in places where we don't expect them. You'll see Russian subs pop up off the coast of Florida. They do it, they wave their hand, and they move on and say, look, we came and you didn't see us coming. China has done that in the midst of U.S. carrier groups. They have uh, diesel electric submarines instead of nuclear submarines. A little older school, but quieter, and they can do the same thing. If you saw the hunt for Red October, I always say that Hollywood's about 25 years ahead of the technology. I should have said this on, a, uh, on the grappler satellite, the kidnapper satellite, because that always reminds me of Moonraker, if you remember that. That's, that came out long before any of you were born, but call it up on Netflix. Anyway, space shuttles grabbing satellites out of space. So, Hunt for Red October, a movie about a quiet submarine, first strike weapon. Uh, this is what's happening right now. That's the new great game under the waves. For this book, and have a read because it's kind of fun, I, I got to go on a U.S. nuclear sub under the Arctic during what are known as the ISEX exercises. These are uh, biannual exercises where U.S. nuclear subs train in tracking, in particular, Russian subs. 
So for a few days, I was under there. It was a live fire exercise. They designate one U.S. sub to be the Russian rabbit, and they try to chase him and find him under there. It was a ball. I spent my birthday there. They baked me a cake. <laughs> no one nicer than the submariners. Uh, and no one with tougher duty, by the way. Final front in the shadow war. And this is the old school one. This is old school 19th century land grab. Both Russia and China are doing it. They've done it. Russia invaded and occupied and annexed a sovereign country in Europe in 2014, and they're still there. First time that happened since World War II. Uh, they're not moving. China, putting a spin on it, just up and created territory in the South China Sea, in the middle of area, first of all, 800 miles off its own shoreline, but in an area of the sea claimed by half a dozen other countries, including U.S. treaty allies, specifically the Philippines, but also Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, turned little rocks that barely peaked above the waters during low tide into what the Navy calls unsinkable aircraft carriers. I went there in, in the height of this construction, flying on a P-8, which is a U.S. surveillance aircraft, it's also a sub-hunter, watching them uh, as they, they would have 20-some-odd dredgers around one of these little atolls, just pumping up, scooping up the dirt, pumping it out. They added thousands of football fields of territory in the span of a few months, and then later, despite repeated pop promises to the U.S. Uh, not to militarize, added hardened uh, hangars, a runway capable of carrying every uh, Chinese warplane, surface-to-air missiles, you name it. They're militarized. Happening before our eyes. So both Russia and China, old, no need for really whiz-bang technology there. Just go in and grab it, take it. And we've sanctioned them, and we sail some ships by them. We've issued some critical comments. Hasn't changed the facts on the ground or the facts on the sea in either Ukraine or China. Who won that front of the shadow war, or at least who's winning it? So those are the four fronts. Influence operations, space, my favorite. Submarines, if you get a chance to ride one, please do. Uh, and just old school 19th century land grabs. And I want to bring that back to today because I do want to get to questions. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. Ukraine, back in the news today. Why do we care about Ukraine? Ukraine's a friendly country. It's trying to do democracy. It's trying to clean things up. Uh, and trying to get a closer association with Europe while balancing its relationship with Russia. None of the stuff it wants is that outlandish. And you would imagine, based on prior U.S. foreign policy, it's things we've supported in countries like this. And by the way, it's currently at war with Russia. And people are getting shot every day. 13,000 people could fill this auditorium 10 times. Uh, that's why the U.S. was giving military assistance. And that's why the question of this delay of the military assistance, as Democrats are alleging, in connection with political favors here at home, matters. What was the U.S. willing to trade for that political information? I've been to Ukraine. It may seem a million miles away. I get that reaction when I talk to people. Why do I really care about Ukraine? Well, I was in Ukraine during the Maidan protests. These were anti-government protests because the prior government, pro-Russian, very corrupt, was trying to steal an election. Sound familiar? With Russian influence. People went out into the streets. What happened to those people? About 100 of them got shot in the head by Ukrainian and Russian snipers. Now, I will still hear, when you talk about inside and outside uh, influence, I will hear from the president's supporters or others who say, yeah, it's, you know, Ukraine, those people, that was a CIA operation. We meddled just like they meddled. We do the same thing the Russians do. We interfere in elections and so on. Okay, maybe. We don't shoot protesters in the head. That's what happened in Maidan. And there was a moment in, in, the, in the book, and I described this, when Secretary Kerry visited the Maidan uh, in 2014 at the height of the protests, where a woman, 70, 80-year-old woman, said to him, all we want is a normal country. That's all they want, something that kind of works in general. And it just strikes me that that is not too much to ask, right? And it shows where, what the U.S. was trying to do there. Now, what strikes me more so, though, is as an American, is that our normal now is being undermined 
We have an expectation of a political system that works, and it does a lot, and it's never been perfect, but the interference from outside is at a degree that it hasn't been before, and that poses real questions for us for how well our normal works, because today our normal is being challenged, and one thing that will come across, I think, in this book is that the sad fact is that those challenges are not just coming from outside the country, they're coming from inside the country. And it's our responsibility, if we care, and I think we do, about how the system functions, uh, to, to rescue that, right? Because we want our normal as well. So that's the substance of the shadow war. I look forward to you guys grilling me. <laughs>
You know, you're never going to get rid of that political division. Uh, but the trouble is, it's provided maximum opportunity uh, for these international actors to interfere. A number of questions coming forward about uh, your perspective on uh, the question, to what degree is the U.S. likely doing the same sorts of disruption mm -hmm. in other countries? So the U.S. interferes in other elections. I suppose you could use the term interfere or tries to influence as well. But I, I think th there is a real danger of false equivalency here. Right? I mean, I, I, talk about, I talked about the Maidan, right? Okay. Do we support uh, pro-democratic organizations in foreign countries? Absolutely. Does that have a political or national security end beyond the ideal of democracy? Absolutely. Uh, do we shoot people in the head? No. We've had some bad acts, but we don't do it as a matter of course. I say that with, with full confidence. There, there are lengths that the others go that we do not. And by the way, no, we haven't. We could. In fact, someone in my book makes an argument for, for using these kind of tactics against a Putin or a Xi, that is, stealing data and then weaponizing it. Okay? Ash Carter, former defense secretary, talks about how do we push back harder, raise the costs for a Russia, say, so that they don't interfere to the degree that they have, that, that, that they are. And he raised, the, he said, listen, you could do this. You could steal Vladimir Putin's financial records and expose them to his people to show them that he's a thief, right? Show them the hard data. You could do that. Now, there are dangers to that as well because there's, you know, like with anything, there's the risk of escalation and, you know, uh, what's the reaction from there? But, but the fact is, to this point, we haven't done it on the scale that they do it. And, and again, listen, I, some folks in the room know history better than me, but I know history well enough to know that in the past, yes, we did. I mean, the CIA has been involved in some coups in its time. Just go to Iran, they will bring up 1954 repeatedly. Um, but uh, I, I do believe the record shows that we don't interfere to the degree they do, uh, certainly not with the violence they do. Um, and by the way, our general view has been to support open political and democratic processes because we perceive that to be in our interests. Here's a question from a student, typical Minnesota student question. How, how has defensive cyber warfare changed U.S. Nas national security strategy? Hmm. Good question. It's a very good question. Damn, I knew the hard ones were going to come from up there. <laughs> so, listen. The U.S. has hardened its defenses since 2016. There's been a decent amount of money spent on, on hardening uh, election security systems in particular, elect voting systems in particular, because that's, of course, the, a real fear. Does the interference, the, the disruption, go so far as to try to mess with the results? And, and we know Russia will try. The question is, will they be successful? And some money, a fair amount of money, has been spent defending those systems. Um, we'll see if it's enough, frankly. Uh, beyond that, the Trump administration, and credit where credit is due, has enabled offensive operations uh, against R Russia and China that the Obama administration did not, uh, specifically planting uh, malware, in effect, in critical Russian infrastructure that could be activated in the event of a cyber war or activated in response to a catastrophic cyber attack on the U.S., you know, part of this is deterrence, right? You, you, you do it, you kind of let them know it, and it's been reported, so they know if they punch you in the nose, you could punch them back. So the Trump administration took a move to be more aggressive in terms of those kinds of operations from a deterrent perspective. Um, you can argue about whether that leads to escalation, but most folks I speak to in the, in the national security space feel like that was a, a reasonable and a good step. So the U.S. is taking, it is taking steps, We'll see if it's enough to defend the next election. The question about Obama and the Obama administration knowledge about Russian interference in the election. To what extent were they aware? And if they were aware, why didn't they take action? So I benefit in this book from self-critical analysis and interviews from a whole host of very senior officials who served in the Obama administration, but also served Republican and Democratic administrations through the years. If you talk to, and I know these guys have been characterized as partisans, but interview Jim Clapper, Michael Hayden, Nash Carter, et cetera, look at their careers. They served under Republicans and Democrats for decades. Uh, and, and they will say, we missed it. I mean, they'll say big picture, 
and I'll get to that in a moment, we missed the rise of the Russia and China threat. But specific to 2016, they saw it, they didn't see it quickly enough, and as they saw it, as 2016 went on, they didn't realize how big and widespread it was until several months in, until they started to make those public statements. And they'll say it, and, and you know, a guy like Jim Clapper has said that on the air multiple times since then. So they, they will grant that they didn't identify it quickly enough, didn't realize how broad it was, and didn't react quickly enough. Now, to be fair, if we're making comparisons, President Obama did twice directly confront Vladimir Putin in the midst of this, once to his face during a G20 meeting, and, and once closer to the election, he used one of the red phone communication lines, which was designed to communicate to prevent nuclear war, to deliver another message saying, do not interfere in, in the election, specific to don't mess with the voting processes in 2016. So during that time period, the president did directly confront Putin. We're, of course, in a situation now where the sitting president, again, I'm just stating the record, uh, has repeatedly questioned whether Russia interfered and, of course, had his famous Helsinki moment where he stood next to Putin and said, well, he denies it. So, you know, th th there is due criticism for the Obama administration. When you compare the reaction between the two, it's a marked difference. A number of questions coming forward about the Baltic states mm -hmm. that are, in, in a way, uh, under threat as you, uh, Ukraine was. Uh, and uh, the, the Estonia operation that, that the Russians uh, took, uh, took uh, the offensive action against Estonia. How much threat is there in, in your judgment to those states and what is the U.S. as NATO ally doing anything about protecting those states from Russia? So Estonia is on the front lines literally and figuratively. They're right, they're a tiny country of little more than a million right on Russia's border. Russia has never acknowledged or agreed with the Baltic states' independence. Uh, they particularly did not like their entrance into NATO. First chapter of my book is on the what is still to this day the largest nation-on-nation -nation cyber attack in history. In 2007, Russia energized thousands of botnets around the world to, in effect, suffocate digitally this, the country of Estonia, which, which is one of the most advanced digital states. They, they were doing electronic voting well, well ahead of us, banking, etc. Eventually, Estonia to survive had to cut itself off from the world, turn the switch, and then kind of like reboot in effect after a few weeks and get things up, up and running again. Since then, Russia has done a whole host of other kinds of activities, skirmishes on the border. There's a reason why the U.S. deployed a small contingent of Marines there, because they, they want to make it clear to Russia, don't pull a Ukraine here. Now, the question though is, does Russia believe, because any alliance is about deterrence, does Russia believe that the U.S. would come to Estonia's defense militarily if Russia did in Estonia what it did in Ukraine? Would you? What would you? Raise your hand if you think, if you're Putin and you had to make a guess, would the U.S. defend militarily Estonia under this president? Raise your hand if you think the answer is yes. Okay, there's a lot of shaking. For the radio hands. audience, there's, a, I think I see one hand. Yeah. It's a lot of head shaking. So that's a concern. When I talk to folks at the Pentagon, et cetera, about what are the potential next fronts of a shadow war, they bring up two places, Estonia, because they worry about Russia reading these signals as a welcome, or at least a wave off, right? The other one is Taiwan. Real concern about Taiwan and how does China read America's commitment to Taiwan? It's an open question. So, uh, you know, I, I, I interview a whole host of Estonians for this book, including the president, who's, I mean, they're the most impressive people in the world, world I've got to say. They're just tough as can be. And they, they are steadfast and like, we're going to, we know how to beat back. And they figured out loads of ways to beat back against it. But it's a tiny country and it needs the U.S. And, and they have privately questions about whether the U.S. would deliver. Can you talk about the concept of, I think you call it a gray zone, that is uh, where Provocations go just to a certain point, but not far enough to provoke a reaction yes. from the U.S., and that's happening around the world. That, that's part of the brilliance of the shadow war, in that these, China and Russia, again, two very different countries, different continents, religions, histories, intentions, and I'll get to that too. I'll bet you someone's going to ask about it, what their goals are. But they use very similar tactics here on these various fronts, and they do it in such a way that is very similar and clever, which is calculating the threshold for a decisive U.S. response 
and then acting just below that threshold. And you can argue they've done a pretty good job of that, right? They invaded a European country. They're still there five years later. Yes, there have been sanctions on Russian individuals and entities. How many times have you heard that phrase? They're still there. I think Putin calculated pretty well what our threshold to a decisive, certainly military action, but I mean, there are other ways you could have responded short of military action, which, you, which the U.S. has not done. China repeatedly lied to the U.S. about militarizing these islands. They went ahead and did it, and they're still there. What has the U.S. done? We, we fly planes over them. I was on one of them. We sail ships by them to demonstrate we don't recognize those islands uh, as being Chinese, and it's still international waters, but facts on the sea, kind of hard to deny. So again, China, Beijing, calculated pretty well what the threshold for decisive U action, U.S. retaliation is. And that's part of the brilliance here. You know, both Russia and China don't want to go to full-on war with the U.S. They're preparing for it. That's why they have weapons in space, et cetera, so they could win or at least hold their own. But they, they've calculated they could get a lot without going to war. And I think the record shows that they've been pretty smart about it. Russia and China are two very different nations. One ascendant, China, economically and otherwise, having moved from a country that was heavily in poverty and now uh, much less so in recent decades, and another in decline, Russia. Yeah. Uh, to equate the two of them in your book as you do, uh, I think can be troubling to some who see these the, the opportunities for the U.S. in the future mm. are very different with these two nations in yeah. terms of the market economy, for instance. We do a lot more trade with China than we do with mm -hmm. Russia. Uh, is it fair to equate the two of them as sort of co-conspirators in the mm. shadow wars? Well, don't get me wrong. I don't equate them as conspirators. I do equate the tactics because they, they use very similar tactics in this war with both different intentions but also different capabilities. So in the most general terms, uh, this is the way folks in the NATSEC world view it. So, so Russia, declining power, kind of like a cornered rat, you know, da more danger of striking out because they feel threatened, that kind of thing. Uh, China, a much more powerful country in economic terms, diplomatic terms, physical size, population, etc., cetera, uh, that has a long-term uh, plan of surpassing the U.S as the number one power. That's, their, that's not a secret. You hear it in their president's speeches, you read it in academic journals, you read it in newspaper editorials there. The intention is to surpass, replace and surpass the U.S. Russia has more of a zero-sum game approach. Their perception is any time they drag the U.S. down, that's a win, win for them. If I could stick my thumb in America's eye, that's a win. You know, a little bit in Ukraine, a little bit in North Korea, maybe kind of help with Brexit. That's another place where they've interfered, and so on. Uh, so equate the tactics, but not the intentions, but also not the level of the threat. Now, to your point, the U.S. has enormous trade with China. This has been, in many ways, a mutually beneficial relationship. Now, there are enormous costs to that relationship. And China, trust me, I spent a lot of time in China. I hear the president on this. They treat U.S. firms lousy. You know, there is no fair trade playing field there. Um, that said, we trade to the tune of you know, hundreds of billions of dollars a year with big benefits on both sides to a degree we never did with the Soviet Union and don't today with Russia. Uh, so the question is, how can you harness the shared, the mutual interests to uh, overshadow or, or take precedence over the real issues of, of division and disagreement and, and where your national security interests come into, into clash. That's a challenge for, for statesmen, right? And that's a real, and it doesn't, as, as we're approaching this, we have to know that there's tremendous benefit if we could find a path towards a more positive relationship. No one wants to go to war. That said, you also have to know your enemy. And, well, let's say adversary. You have to know your adversary. And, and their tactics, their intent, is to bring us down. So if we, we got to wise up to that and figure out a way to respond. You're a journalist, and we expect our journalists to be nonpartisan, not mm -hmm. to advocate a particular position one, or, one way or another. This book and your presentation sounds like you're moving a bit out of a journalistic approach and more toward a, a, an advocacy. Mm -hmm. Something else is motivating you. 
in my, my impression, this is a question for myself, okay. by the way. All right. So. <laughs> my, are you an advocate or are the, you a journalist? The, the, the minister's prerogative. Exactly. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> I'm in the pulpit now, don't you see? <laughs> and I just got disconnected. I think that was a yeah. message. <laughs> I'm watching this. So, in the simplest terms, no. I mean, I, I first of all, read the book and... and um, no, I, say, I, I don't say it with, with any... I'm just saying, if you read the book, you see that I spread the blame around to Democrat and Republican. I will say this, notably, the two best reviews I got from my book were in the Washington Examiner and the National Review Online. They don't talk nicely about CNN. And, and the reason I did is because when you look at this, I, I take shots at the Obama administration for repeatedly missing... First of all, for, I'll tell you, in the, in the context of the South China Sea, for accepting China's promises that they wouldn't militarize in the face of contradictory information. And lo and behold, we got played, you know? Obama got played on that. Uh, you could say the same with Ukraine. They tried to turn it around at the end, didn't reverse it. So, uh, you know, the, the fact is, personally, based on my reporting and speaking to folks who served again, Republican and Democratic presidents, there's a lot of blame to go around. And uh, by the way, th those folks I spoke to and interviewed for the book, you know, senior officials who were involved as this was happening, they take the blame too. They say we missed it. We thought Russia and China were gonna come around to our point of view. And over the course of years, and again, through Republican and Democratic administrations, uh, they kind of deluded themselves. Ash Carter uses the term mirroring a lot, that we, we looked at Russia and China and thought they wanted what, what we wanted. Uh, and even in the face of contradictory information, that delusion persisted. Um, how are we on time? Because I want to tell a story that's telling on that, Go if ahead. I can. So, you remember the Skripal poisoning, okay? Or attempted, well, they poisoned him, they didn't kill him. Uh, last year, Salisbury, England, Russia uses the most powerful nerve agent ever created by man, Novichuk, to attempt to kill Sergei Skripal and his daughter, Yulia, on the streets of Salisbury, England. Uh, this is a horrible way to die causes convulsions, vomiting. It's just meant to be a public and horrible execution. There's a reason they chose that weapon. Um, and by the way, they brought in enough Novichuk to kill thousands of people. Brazenness of this. So in the wake of that, I talked to a lot of European diplomats who said, man, this is the worst we've ever seen. This is a crossing of a Rubicon. We have to wise up. We have to push back. We've never seen anything like this. And I said, yes, this is shocking and alarming. But 12 years before, in 2006, I was in London, and I covered the murder of Alexander Litvinenko with, with polonium-210, a radioactive element designed to call a horrible and painful death. The reason the Russians chose it. By the way, the Russians brought in enough of that stuff to kill hundreds of people. Uh, and by the way, it affected, does, in fact, or contaminated rather, dozens of people in the UK because they were just so brazen with it. They flew over on a commercial airlines flight, they walked around London, they left radioactive traces wherever they went, and people were, there were primary, secondary, tertiary contaminations from it because the Russians didn't care. They were carrying out an assassination on, on UK soil. By the way, it was two weeks before my wedding because I covered that and went to all these sites. I had to be tested for contamination. <laughs> At, which is a process I'm not going to describe here, but involves supplying a lot of liquid and then they fly some ions through it and make sure you're not contaminated. I was not. But the, the reason I raise that point is that 12 years before Russia had committed murder on British soil and threatened the lives of dozens of people with enormous gall. Why, and, but that was a Republican president followed by a Democratic president followed by a Republican president. During that time, a whole host of officials of both parties didn't see and recognize what was happening here and react quickly enough. So uh, my point in the book is that we all missed it. And that's not a political statement. It's just I think the, the record shows it. Given what you've described today and what your mm -hmm. book describes, are you hopeful? Are you seeing any signs of positive change from uh, the U.S. government or the military? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to surprise you. I am hopeful. I am. I First of all, I spent a lot of time with the men and women on the front lines of this. Space Command on a submarine under the, the Arctic, uh, inside the NSA Operations Center. Um, 
people who take, and, and by the way, on Capitol Hill, people on the relevant committees, not all of them, but they take the intelligence seriously and they're looking for answers. And these are good, dedicated men and women, some in uniform, some not in uniform, who care and are taking risks to push back and win this. And then there are people I meet like you who are informed and care and are taking part, right? I mean, that's, that's the best that we could do. There's no magic bullet to this. Um, we all have to participate, and I meet, and then I meet folks your age. I was at uh, University of Montana a couple weeks ago giving a similar talk, met the university kids there, had a lot of questions, and you meet them, and you're like, geez, they're so much smarter than I was at that age, so much more informed, and they care, and they're doing good stuff. So yes, I am hopeful. That said, there are a lot of bad actors in our own country, and, and that, that part to me is an American. I mean, you ask my motivation, it's like, I don't have a copy of the book in front of me, but literally the last uh, two paragraphs of the book describe what my motivation is, and it's as a concerned American. I spent years covering this stuff. I spent time in China and Russia. I see how they treat people at home and abroad, and I don't want them to treat my fellow Americans that way. That to me is not a Democratic or a Republican statement. It's an American, it's a citizen statement, and that's my motivation for writing. Thank you, Jim Shurdo.